Okay, let's talk about Jean Piaget's cognitive developmental theory. We have Sigmund Freud, who came up with the psychosexual developmental theory, and we have Eric Erickson, who came up with the psychosocial developmental theory, and now we have Jean Piaget, who came up with the cognitive developmental theory. Early on, Piaget's work was rejected by the scientific community. Piaget came up with his ideas for his theory based on experiments he did with his own children. Now you can imagine that the scientific community would think of research done by a parent on his own children to be pretty sketchy. However, in later experiments, other researchers were able to completely replicate Piaget's findings. And so his theory was later validated by other experimenters. For each developmental stage, Piaget designed an experiment to determine when the child had obtained the cognitive abilities required to move up to the next stage. The first stage for Jean Piaget, his cognitive theory is the sensory motor stage, and it goes from birth until about age 18 to 24 months. When my first child, Lainey, was an infant, she had that problem where she stayed up crying a lot at night. So my wife and I were exhausted. We took turns getting up with the baby and trying to settle her down, give her a bottle and those kind of things. But I remember having these experiences where Lainey settled down and she was just dead quiet and her eyes were open and she was looking straight into my eyes and I felt this real sense of bonding and I remember wondering what she was possibly thinking about. Well according to Piaget she wasn't thinking about much at all. <laughs> and our bonding experience may have been a little lopsided. He said the majority of the mental activity in an infant is used in learning how to use the machine, learning how to use their bodies. Infants don't know how to focus their eyes, so they don't understand depth, they don't understand color, they don't understand dimensions. They don't know how to operate their hands or their arms or their leg. There is a huge amount for children to learn at this stage. He calls it the sensory motor stage because sensory is about the senses, learning how to use them and motor has to do with movement and the body and how to use that. So the experiment Piaget designed for moving beyond the sensory motor stage had to do with the concept of object permanence. And what object permanence is, it just means that you're able to hold an object in your mind even when it's not sitting in front of you, even though you can't see it. So in an infant's world, they are truly in the moment so that when something is gone from their field of vision from the infant's experience it has gone from the universe it has disappeared completely that's why they love the game peekaboo because when a parent puts their face behind their hands the infant experiences that as my parent has literally disappeared and when they remove their hands and say peekaboo, the child is elated because suddenly somehow their parent has magically reappeared. The experiment for object permanence that Piaget designed is very similar to the peekaboo game. What he did was he put a toy in front of the child and then blocked the child from being able to see the toy by either putting it under a blanket or putting a, a barrier in front of it and then removing the barrier, showing the child that the object's still there and then hiding it. So a child who has not achieved object permanence, when you hide that toy, they just completely lose interest. The toy has disappeared, it's gone forever, and they move on to whatever <laughs> else is in their field of vision. But when a child achieves object permanence, they're able to hold that toy in their mind. And they're able to understand that even though the toy is covered with a blanket or a barrier, it still exists. It exists in my mind and I understand that it still exists in the world. So Piaget puts the toy under a blanket and the child pulls the blanket off. The child has just demonstrated object permanence. The child understands that the object is still there even though it was covered with the blanket and out of their field of vision. In some ways, this might be a really early, primitive understanding of time. Instead of just living in the moment, I can understand that in the past, 
this toy was covered with a blanket and it's still there. Okay, stage two is pre-operational and it runs from age two to about age seven and the mental ability required to move to the next stage is called symbolic thought and it has to do with egocentrism. Now egocentrism is a term that means an inability to see the world through any other perspective than your own. So adults continue to have egocentrism, but children at this age have it in a much more concrete way. So an example of adult egocentrism is this. Imagine you have a friend who's in a bad relationship. Their person they're in a relationship with lies and cheats and says mean things to them and they come to you for advice. What should I do? Well, your advice is quick and simple and easy. You tell them to drop them. You need to dump them. But that's because you are looking at their problem through your eyes and not through their eyes. Because if you've ever been in a bad relationship where somebody cheated and lied and treated you poorly, you know that dropping them or dumping them is not nearly as easy as it should be because there are so many other variables involved. You know, that person and I are very attracted to each other. We have these wonderful moments together. We laugh together. We have so much in common. You know, that they're not always mean. They don't always cheat. I really think it's going to be okay. So in other words, if you were not egocentric, you would try to understand where your friend is actually coming from rather than just looking at their problem through your eyes and seeing the very simple solution of uh, leaving the bad relationship. Another example is racism. If you are of one race and you think you know what's best for another race or what they need to do, that's a sign of egocentrism. If you want to really understand what it is like to live life as a person of another race, you would have to spend a whole lot of time with a person of another race and ask a whole lot of questions and do a whole lot of listening. And even then, you could only approximate understanding what it is to go through life as a person of another race. At any rate, for the kid in the pre-operational stage, Piaget's experiment is this. He has a toy mountain, okay? And on one side of the mountain, he places a toy, a doll. And on the other side of the mountain, kind of below the mountain, he has a little house. And the question, the question you ask the kid is, can the person in the little house see the doll. Well, we know as adults that the mountain would obstruct the view of the doll, and of course the person in the little house could not see the doll. But a child who has not moved beyond the pre-operational stage would say, because they can see the doll, they assume that the person in the house could also see the doll. So they would say, yeah, of course, you know, can't you see the doll right there? Duh. When the child demonstrates understanding that, oh, I don't know if I was actually trying to see the doll from the house, let me put myself mentally in that situation. And then I can understand that the amount of obstructs a view of the doll. The next stage is called concrete operations and a child typically is in this stage between ages 7 and 11. The cognitive ability that a child must demonstrate in order to move out of the concrete operational stage is called operational thought, and the experiment Piaget uses has to do with conservation of matter. This is a concept you may have heard in science. People in the concrete operational stage understand the mechanics of the world very well. What they have trouble with is abstract or theoretical thought. So here's the experiment. Piaget has two glasses with the exact same amount of water in them. He pours the contents of one glass into a beaker, which is long and tall, and he pours the contents of the other glass into a tray, which is short and wide. He then asks the child which one of the containers, the beaker or the tray, hold the most fluid. When the child is in the stage of concrete operations, they say, well, the beaker has more water. Look at the water level. But when a child has moved beyond concrete operations, they understand that it's the same amount of water in both containers. They're just different shapes. 
In fact, the child watched the experimenter pour the exact same amount of water into both containers. <laughs> Even though most children will reach an age when they understand conservation of matter, that doesn't mean that they necessarily demonstrate a lot of strength in the next stage, which is formal operations. The formal operational stage goes from adolescence to adulthood, and unfortunately, only about 17% of the human race ever really successfully demonstrates strong formal operational ability. There is no next level, but the goal for, for formal operations is abstract thinking. And again, abstract thought is not well developed in most adults. There are several experiments that have been used to demonstrate formal operational thought. One has to do with logic. Here is a logic problem for you. A is taller than B, but not as tall as C, and D is taller than E, but not as tall as B. Who is the tallest of all of them? Solving this problem requires manipulating a lot of variables in your mind. Another experiment they do is called the third eye. So you ask the subject to imagine that they were going to be given a third eye. And to think long and hard about it, if you were going to get a third eye, where would you want it to be on your body? And the last one I'll share with you is called the pendulum problem. In this one, the subject has shown a picture of a pendulum. Pendulum is just a weight that's suspended by a string and you push it and it swings back and forth. But they're asked to imagine that they have four different lengths of string and four different sizes of weights. They're asked to determine which factor would cause the pendulum to swing the fastest. Would it be the length of the string or the size of the weight? So here are the answers to the formal operational problems. For the first one, about who's the tallest, they go in this order. C is the tallest, then A, then B, then D, and then E. On the third eye problem, the idea here is to consider what would be the most advantageous place to have a third eye. A person in the concrete operational stage will say, right in the middle of my forehead, because we've seen pictures of that third eye that's sort of between your eyebrows. There is really no advantage to having a third eye on your forehead, but there would be a big advantage to having a third eye in the back of your head, because then you could see in front of you and you could see behind you. It would also be super advantageous if you had the third eye on your hand, because then you could look around corners using your hand without actually stepping around that corner. You could also raise your hand and have a new visual perspective from a greater height. And the last one, the pendulum problem, the shorter the string, the faster the pendulum would move. The weight doesn't matter.